Um, hi, y'all. I am Dr. Anushree Balor. I am a senior staff psychologist at the Counseling Center. And I've actually given this talk, Being Brave in Research, a couple of times. Um, and I'm really glad every time, I think this is the first time I've actually had like a lot more people. This room is fully filled. Um, so I'm excited to see everyone. And um, hopefully the information we kind of go over today will be helpful. Um, so in terms of what we are going to talk a little bit more about today is one, we'll start mindfully and I'll go over that a little bit. But mainly, we'll just talk about what does it mean to be brave in research. And part of that is going over how to manage imposter thoughts and what is the experience of an imposter phenomenon and how to lead, like how to have curiosity lead the way for you, right? And then also how to make, wait, like, you know, maintain your energy um, and your curiosity along the way because the quarter's long. I know it's week four, but you got six more weeks to go. And you also have the rest of your careers as well. So how to maintain your energy in the meantime, too. So in terms of starting mindfully, I actually want to um, invite you all to, um, like, well, I know we have a lot more people, so let's do something slightly different. I'm going to invite you all to just like take a look at this picture and observe whatever you can. What stands out to you with this picture? What colors? What textures? Where does your mind go? Just observe what, what's coming out for you, like coming up for you as you're looking at this picture. What are some details that stick out to you? So, um, curious, um, what is sticking out to y'all as you're just taking a moment to pause and look at it? The greens, like nature. Okay, cool. Pattern. Yeah, thank you. Yeah? Like sunlight coming through the trees. Sunlight coming through the trees, thank you. Anyone else? Yeah? The trail. The trail, yeah. <laughs> True, yeah, there's some movement. You can infer some movement, yeah? Dense, yeah, yeah, all right. Um, so I wanted to just um, you know, take this time to intentionally pause here, because I know we've all had some busy days and it's at the end of the day and you're here listening to me talk. So I wanted to just sort of pause for a minute and I know it's also midterm, so this is just a nice way of pausing even for yourself. If you're um, just, you don't have too much time, but you do need to just pause for a little bit, it's okay to just even to stare you know, at like a painting or a picture, Think about the times when, if you kind of go to museums, right? What holds your attention in paintings? Um, just look at the vibrant colors. You don't have to assign too much meaning of it, but if you can, if you want to, go for it. But it's just really looking at, mindfully looking at all the details that are coming out and observing what's coming up for you within you, right? That's also mindfulness. So mindfulness doesn't always have to be this meditative practice. It can be, it's one form of mindfulness where you're sitting and meditating. But other forms of mindfulness is honestly doing things one mindfully, which is paying attention to what you're doing at that one moment in time very intentionally, right? And this time, it was just slowing things down, looking at this picture, seeing what stands out to you. All right, so I wanted to also, my next question to y'all is, what does it mean to be brave in research? What comes up for you when I ask that question? Not being afraid to ask. Yeah, I love that. Curiosity, absolutely. Yeah, anyone else? Yeah? Reaching out to faculty. Reaching out to faculty. Love it. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, leaning into that discomfort. Absolutely. Yeah, great answers. Anyone else? Last thoughts? Challenging paradigms. Yes. I love it. Challenging paradigms and maybe even struggling, right, as you're challenging. Yes, absolutely. Great answers. I love it. So um, the next set of things I want to just do is keep in mind what, you know, all, what, is that, what does it mean to be brave and the next set of questions too, all right? And you can answer it to yourselves and I'm going to ask you to just reflect on it, all right? So have you ever sort of believed that your accomplishments are because of luck? timing or error and do you ever find yourself telling yourself that if I can do it anyone can 
and do you agonize over the smallest flaws in your work? And are you crushed by constructive criticism because it seems that it's an evidence of your ineptness? And when you do succeed, do you secretly feel like you fool them all? And do you ever worry that it's just a matter of time before you're found out? All right, I'm just going to give you a moment to just reflect on these questions for yourself. And the thing is, if you ever found yourself saying yes to any or many of these questions, good news, you're in good company. Right? Um, kind of like even people that we are, you know, they're incredibly intelligent, incredibly accomplished, have done a lot to the field, like Einstein. The quote he has is, the exaggerated esteem in which my life work is held makes me ill at ease. I feel compelled to think of myself as an involuntary swindler, right? So this is someone like Einstein who may have actually just answered yes to any of these. And Maya Angelou, I've written 11 books, but each time I think, uh-oh, they're going to find out now. I run a game on everyone, and they're going to find me out, right? So people who we think are incredibly accomplished in their fields also experience moments of feeling like an imposter of, yeah, I've fooled them all, right? Where that, that, that sense of like self-doubt creeps in no matter how much they've done, right? So I want to first just normalize it. So if ever you found yourself saying yes to any of these questions, it's okay. It's not a bad thing. Um, and that's actually what is a sign of an imposter phenomenon actually, if you think about it. So um, a lot of these imposter phenomenons is one, um, you know, feeling like you're undeserving of any recognition or success, just shying away from any sort of limelight shed upon you. And, um, you know, kind of difficulty internalizing any sort of um, accomplishments or recognition, right? Just sort of saying, uh, if someone is saying, hey, great job on that, you're like, no, I kind of got lucky. Right? Uh, when in reality, you may have worked really hard, but you're trying, you know, you're having a harder time internalizing that. Or even attributing any personal successes to external factors other than your own ability or intelligence. Right? So just again, saying, I got lucky that I got into UCI. Right? Rather than saying, you worked incredibly hard to get in here. Um, or believing that one has fooled others into overestimating their own abilities. Right? I'm terrified that someone is going to find out that I'm not supposed to be here and someone at the admissions office messed up. Like, I don't know what they were thinking, but I just got lucky. I'm here. Let me just sort of put my head down and just kind of get through and try to make the most of it, right? That's one version of an imposter phenomenon. And also engaging in a lot of self-deprecating behaviors and um, discontinuing any positive feedback, right? So. I don't know about y'all, but it's not uncommon. When we get any sort of feedback on, say, a paper you've written, and you get a lot of good comments of saying, interesting point, great, I love how you've written this here, and then you get that one comment that says, hmm, interesting, you could have added more here. It seems like this needs to, a little bit more substance. I don't know about you all. When I got feedback from my advisor about that, I obsessed about that feedback incessantly and ignored the rest of the feedback that she had given me saying, I had made some good points, right? Saying it was crushing because I was like, I did not do a good job at me because she just that said that I messed up in this one thing, right? So that is actually one of the signs and experience of an imposter phenomenon. And that seeing that failure is always looming at the horizon, right? Always sort of saying, oh wow, if I mess this up, everything is gone, right? Constantly feeling that the worst case scenario, which is, I'm going to mess up. I'm going to lose everything. It's always going to happen. And doubting the ability to repeat past accomplishments. Again, if you're saying, I got lucky that I pulled that off. I, I turned in that, that assignment. I turned in that paper. I got lucky. I don't know how I pulled it off, but I did. I don't know if I'll ever be able to do it again. That's part of doubting your ability to repeat something, right? And um, fearing exposure as an imposter or fraud. Like, 
oh God, what if someone actually finds out that I'm not supposed to be here? I kind of slipped in somehow, right? Um, or feeling relief. This is a bigger one. Feeling relief rather than a sense of joy or even accomplishment when you do finish something, when you do succeed at something, right? Relief is like, oh my God, I can't believe I pulled it off or I finished it. Wow. Um, that's a sense of relief versus actually just saying, wow, I'm really proud of myself for actually working really hard to get something done. Right? So it's kind of living in that perpetual state of like fear of I'm going to get found out that I'm not supposed to be here or failure is always happening. I don't know. I need to prevent it somehow. Right? It's, it's living under the constant fear and anxiety. So those are some signs of imposter phenomenon. Um, and I want to just like point out, I love this. Well, first off, I love BuzzFeed and this pie chart from BuzzFeed, I think it kind of captures everything that we sometimes can feel about getting compliments from others. But also this quote is, imposters see themselves as unworthy of the level of praise they're receiving because they do not believe that they have earned such recognition based on their capabilities, causing heightened levels of anxiety and stress. Right? Um, so I wanted to like pause here and check in with you all to see what's coming up with all the information I've just sort of talked about. Relatable, not really. What's the temperature like? I guess it was just scary because I didn't realize that it had a name. Uh -huh. Yeah. The word. Okay. Okay. So yeah, it's it's a lot more common. Yeah. Absolutely. Thank you for sharing. Yeah. Anyone else? All right. I'm gonna just like take that as a sign of y'all like are thinking and letting it settle in. Um, but why does actually this happen even in the first place? Because as you mentioned, like it's so common, but we feel like it's very isolating when you're experiencing these these imposter thoughts and phenomenon, it can feel very isolating because if you're often just saying, I don't know if I'm supposed to be here, but I can't talk about it because people will find out I'm not supposed to be here, it sort of brings in a lot of shame and guilt about feeling a certain way. When in fact, it's quite common, right? There is a name to it. it either goes by imposter phenomenon, imposter syndrome, right? Um, and, but why does this happen? Kind of like, there are many factors, but I think the three main ones here are family, school, and society, right? So when we're talking about family, oftentimes well-meaning families, well-loving families, well-intentioned parents and family members will often do this. When you come home with a report card and it's a 92, the question could be, if you grew up in families like mine, the question could be, Great, but what happened to the 100%? What's, where's the 8%? Where's that missing, right? Or if you come home with a report card where you're getting, you know, a couple of A's, a couple of B's, and there's that one C. The focus is, what happened to the C here? Why is there even a C in the first place? Discounting the fact that there are some A's there to celebrate, right? So the messages that we can internalize from that is, Ignore the accomplishments, focus on what's wrong, <laughs> right? When in fact, first off, you're passing a class, hooray. Um, but second off, it just sort of, it's always the focus is on what are you not doing enough of versus let's actually celebrate what you have done something right also, right? It's a yes and versus no, just forget all the things that you worked hard on, just focus on what you need to work harder versus, right? So that's the messages we kind of internalize. So when you get to college and you're in a rigorous call, like, you know, quarter system where you blink and, you know, a week goes by. And if you miss one class, that's like 10% of the quarter is gone. It can just be a lot when you look at your grades and you just find yourself saying, wait, I worked really hard, but I'm only getting like a B here. So that must mean that, you know, there's something wrong with me as a student, right? You might question yourself. Right? And just sort of say, and never mind that you might have gotten feedback from you know, other classes and other papers where you're doing really, really well, but you're focused on, I'm not a good student because I got a B in one of my classes. Right? And that can just sort of be a form of imposter phenomenon. 
It doesn't make you a bad student. It just makes you a student who did well in other classes, and maybe this is not a strength of yours. Right? Or maybe it might be something you'll have to work harder on, but it doesn't make you a bad student. You have plenty of other strengths. So you kind of internalize, start internalizing messages to only just focus on what you kind of are doing badly on versus actually recognizing that you do have strengths, you do have accomplishments. The other part is school. Like UCI is a competitive, competitive school. But chances are, even through you know, elementary, middle school, high school, right, you were a part of a very competitive group of students, worked really hard, and you know, there was a message sort of, again, reinforced over time of just saying, don't even tell other people if you're struggling, because if you're in a super competitive environment, it means that you can't really struggle or fail. That might be one of the messages that you're internalizing. Right? If I'm struggling at something, that means that I'm bad at it. When in reality, if you're struggling at something, it just might mean that you're growing into it. Right? So um, sometimes schools can also just be part of that. Um, so the message of, of, yes, it can be competitive, but it can also be used as a way to grow versus saying, I'm failing at it. Right? So it's kind of adopting a growth mindset can be a way to combat imposter um, phenomenon. And we'll kind of go over that a little bit more. And then finally, society, feeling like an outsider. Right? Um, so I think particularly if you go walk into a room and you don't see a lot of yourself represented in a room, you're going to feel like an outsider. And the message implicitly kind of given is, oh, I'm not supposed to be here. Right? So think of the various systems that we're in, right? Even including at UCI, I know we're, doing, we're trying to do as best as possible to make it more inclusive and diverse on campus. But sometimes when we walk into a room, we can feel like maybe I'm not supposed to be here because I'm the only one here. Right? And that can feel like I'm not supposed to be here. I'm supposed to be an outsider. I got in somehow. Right? Um, that can contribute to an imposter phenomenon experience. The other part is, um, you know, if you're more likely like a person of color or um, a woman in a, um, in a STEM field where you might not be seeing too much of you being represented, you might have those thoughts come up, right? But it doesn't mean that you're not supposed to be there. It just means that you'll have to kind of, you'll be part of the first generation of representation, right? Um, and then that also can bring a lot of pressure too, right? We'll kind of, that's a separate talk altogether. But that's just, it just doesn't take away the fact that you're supposed to be here because you've worked incredibly hard to be here. The other part is Insta life. I don't know about you, but if I go through Instagram, I'm scrolling, I'm like, wow, everyone's just traveling everywhere, living their best lives, and everyone's just accomplishing so much. I mean, the new version of uh, social connections is now LinkedIn, apparently, more so than any other things. If you look, go through some people's LinkedIn's, you're like, how much are you doing? How are you capturing all of this? Where do you just like, do you even breathe? Do you live? Do you eat? It seems like you're working so much and doing so much, right? Part of that is it can feel like contribute to that so a sense of inadequacy that you're not doing enough. And that too is, is contributing to the pressure to say, I'm supposed to be doing more, or maybe I'm not supposed to be here because I'm not doing so much as the other person, right? Um, and with Instagram, you just throw in a filter and everything looks gorgeous. Um, is Finsta still a thing? I know a couple of years ago it was, it was and I, every year I check if it's still a thing where people had other like Finsta accounts where they were more real about things. Is that still a thing? OK, that's a thing. OK, so the whole point of having a Finsta just tells you everything you need to know about social media, right? If you're having an Instagram account where you're only talking about how good life is, and then you have a separate Finsta account where you're like, oh, yeah, day to day, I'm struggling, <laughs> right? And you're being more real about it, then that tells you everything you need to know about social media, right? People only post about things and th might throw in a filter about all the end goals of accomplishments, even on LinkedIn, right? About, yes, I've done this, I've accomplished this. But no one really talks about how hard it was to get there, right? The struggle is really, really difficult, and no one really highlights that, of just saying, to get to that outcome of me doing really well or getting this research grant, I had to fail and get rejected multiple times, right? That's also part of um, the experience of success, right? So, a whole bunch of things are culminating and you know, um, contributing to the experience of imposter phenomenon. Right? Also going to take a pulse here. How are people feeling so far about this information? 
Okay. I like it. Very succinct. Okay, thumbs up. Okay, we'll go with it. All right. Um, okay. All right. So, uh, how else does it show up? Right. Um, over preparing, kind of like if you're constantly living under the threat of failure and fear that you'll be find out, found out that you're not supposed to be here, you can go, aha, I'm going to just like prepare so hard that no one will ever find out that I'm not supposed to be here. I'm going to put 200% of my effort so no one can actually just even find out that I'm anxious about it. They'll just see that I'm super prepared when you're really over prepared. And other times, it could be procrastination. If you're constantly just telling yourself that I have to be perfect, I don't know about y'all, but that's overwhelming and I want to avoid that task. And oftentimes procrastination and perfectionism go hand in hand. So sometimes people who, I have a different view of procrastination, I see it more as a working style. I say embrace it, work with it, with your working style, just prepare ahead of time but we can have a talk about it later on, or you can just YouTube or TED Talk it. Um, but if you're just like tending to like procrastinate, it might just be because at the last minute, you can let go of your perfectionism and just say, who cares about my incredibly high standards? My goal is now just to get it done. And you can talk to many procrastinators. What they'll often just say is, when I do get it done at the last minute, somehow I actually do well. I don't know how, but I do well. What does that indicate? That indicates that you do know your information. It's not that you don't know enough or you're not accomplished enough or you're not smart enough. It means that you do have enough understanding of the information that you're trying to kind of put out there and you did a good enough job once you let go of this has to be perfect, right? So it can show up as procrastination. It could also show up as self-sabotage where you're saying, I am purposely just, you know, you might not just set out consciously to just sabotage yourself, but some of the behavioral patterns might just over time indicate that, oh yeah, I kind of uh, screwed the pooch there, right? I could have done better. But you're kind of having now excuses saying, well, it's because I only got started like a day before it was due, and that's kind of why. If I had a little bit more time, I could have done better, right? So that could be one form of it. Or just even um, maintaining a lower profile. If you're like really constantly living under that threat that I'll be found out that I'm not supposed to be here or um, questioning yourself, part of it is just saying, I won't stand out too much. Maybe I'm not gonna be that person who's gonna constantly ask questions because if I ask questions, I'll be standing out. And if I'm standing out, I'll be found out more often, right? So maintaining a low profile, or even just never finishing a task in the first place. You might have a lot of good ideas, but just saying, what if what I finish is not gonna be good enough, right? So that could be one form of it. Or just even holding back of just saying, you know, even though I'm interested in this, maybe like, I don't know, maybe the professor will think I'm just way too dumb or I'm not qualified enough. So why even try asking the professor if I can just like participate in something? It could show up that way, right? So holding back from opportunities. And if this goes on long enough, once you've graduated and you're trying to find jobs part, and, you, and you're working, it could look at as, I'm not gonna go for that promotion. I'm not gonna go apply for a higher level position. I'm not gonna ask for that pay raise, right? So it could just like ripple effect down the line. And the impact of it is, yeah, you're not gonna try new things, new roles, new adventures with research. Um, and it could also increase a lot of your stress levels because, again, if you're constantly living with, I need to over-prepare for everything, your stress level is going to go up and you're more likely to isolate yourself with saying, I'm not supposed to talk to others about this, this feeling that I'm having about not being here. And you might even just um, experience that sense of sadness and anxiety, right, over time about it. But more than anything, you know, with balancing out multiple stressors and responsibilities because you'll take on a lot, right? Um, if you're over-preparing, you're like, I'll do it, I'll do it, but then it's a lot at some point. You're not gonna recognize your own strengths because you're constantly living under that, that threat of, I'm not supposed to be here, I need to prove myself constantly that I deserve to be here. And it could lead to that sense of chronic self-doubt, low self-esteem, and even burnout, right, over time. So that's kind of like the impact 
long term of imposter um, phenomenon, right? So, and it could also have ripple effects, not just as a student, but even after a student, like grad school, when you have a job, all of it. So the question here now becomes what to do when this does show up, right? So part of it is, um, first off, becoming aware uh, that you are having imposter thoughts, right? Catching it in the moment that you are having thoughts like that are kind of saying, wait, wh what, what? I'm having a lot of thoughts that I'm not supposed to be here or that I'm not good enough at this. Is that really true? And we'll talk about how to just catch it, check it and change it in a minute. The other part is adopting a growth mindset and maintaining your curiosity. I think someone just talked about having a lot of questions, right? Part, part of being brave in research is sort of saying it's okay to ask questions. It's leaning into your curiosity because if, when you ask questions, it's sort of, you're kind of being a little bit, it's intellectual humility saying I don't know this and that's okay, so I'm going to ask about it to find out, right? That's what curiosity is about. And growth mindset is sort of adopting that set of, it's okay if I don't do well at something. Just because I failed at something doesn't mean that I don't have the ability to learn and grow. You're actually saying I'm fully <coughs> capable of learning and growing even if I fail at something. That is your ability, that is your capability, right? And that's the growth mindset. And seeking out support and mentorship as much as possible, right? TAs, professors, Jerry, uh, <laughs> Anna, Jerry, whoever you want to kind of connect with a little bit more, right? Um, who are your mentors? Who are your support systems? And um, challenging these thoughts as much as possible, right? And identifying your strengths. What are you good at? What are you proud of that you've done? What are you proud of incredibly for like working hard, and maybe you had like the most learning growth, right? That learning curve was steep, but you got there. Those are your strengths as well, right? I identifying how much effort you put into learning things. And then practicing self-compassion. Treat yourself as you would your friend. If your friend comes to you just saying, I'm feeling stupid because I completely bombed this midterm, would you sit there just saying, yeah, you're stupid? Or would you have a different response, right? So treat yourself as you would a friend. And I know these are not apples, they're more peaches, but still, I like this video. An apple is an apple, not an orange, and that's okay. And by that I mean, you have your apples, the person next to you have, has oranges, and just because you don't have oranges doesn't mean you don't have apples. Count your strengths. You don't, your strengths might not look like the same as the person next to you, and that's okay, right? Um, so as you're kind of looking at oranges, don't forget about your apples. So I know we kind of talked about challenging thoughts and catching it in the moment. Um, I have like a few common ones and the ones like here, kind of patterns of thinking that are unhelpful. These are called cognitive distortions. There's a whole list out there, y'all. This is how common they are. You can look it up, just Google cognitive distortions, a whole list will come up. But a few ones that typically come up are catastrophizing, mind reading, emotional reading, I mean reasoning, fortune telling. But with any of these, it's helpful to ask yourself, like, what sort of evidence do I have supporting these thoughts? And what sort of evidence do I have not supporting these thoughts? So you're kind of like playing a lawyer to yourself. And um, for example, if you are mind reading, it's a classic one. So you um, are you are in discussion section. It's started already, and you walk in about five minutes late. What are some thoughts that just come up for you automatically as you walk in late to the class? Could it be in the, along the lines of, oh man, everyone's looking at me, the TA or if the professor is running that section, like, oh my God, they think that I'm probably a bad student. Why is everyone looking at me? Oh my God, right? I'm assuming those are the thoughts. Maybe I'm wrong, but usually that typically happens. But in reality, if you're sitting in a discussion section and a classmate walks in late, first off, do you even care? You might just like look up because you're like, eh, okay, there's a noise there. Okay, go back to whatever you're doing. 
But that's an example of mind reading. Mind reading is a tendency for us to sort of like assume what people are thinking about us in that moment, and we're assuming that they're thinking badly about us. Right? That's mind reading. So what sort of evidence do you have that someone might be thinking that you're a bad student just because you walked in late? Have they told you about it explicitly? Has the TA pulled you to the side and just said, hey, you were late today, you're bad? Or do you have any evidence not supporting these thoughts? You're usually on time, it's just one off. Or just that, okay, well, when I'm, I know when I'm sitting there, someone walks in late, no one really cares, I don't care. That might be evidence not supporting these thoughts. And then is there more to this that I'm not considering? Kind of giving yourself a break of just saying, you know, there's been a lot of rain and I had to like, kind of, I forgot my sweater, I had to go grab my jacket, all of that, that contributed to me being late, okay. And then again, how to empower yourself, right? Just thinking about it as talking, talking to yourself as you would a friend, right? Um, how would you just sort of, what would your advice be? And what's a more balanced way of thinking? I'm not saying always be super positive because that's not possible. Not everything in life is gonna work out 100%, right? However, is it fair to assume that nothing's gonna work out? That's kind of like the black and white thinking. It's like the either or, all or nothing. That's not fair either. So it's kind of looking at a balanced way of this situation, right? What's, what's can it be a little bit of 50-50, right? Um, and what's a more compassionate response to this situation, right? And the other thing I like when we're talking about catastrophizing, which is the tendency to kind of just go to the worst case scenario, questions to ask yourself is, is this the worst case scenario or is this the most likely scenario? And are they the same? If they're different, how are they different? What is the most likely scenario then? Am I jumping to conclusions thinking that the worst case is gonna happen 100% of the time, right? Or say you didn't do well on a paper, how much of that is going to matter to you in a week? Maybe a lot, okay, it's still fresh. How about a month? How about next quarter? How much is it gonna matter to you that you didn't do well on one paper? How much is it gonna matter to you in one year? How much is it gonna matter to you in five years? In 10 years, right? So it's kind of like that perspective taking that might also be helpful when you're experiencing a lot more of those worst case scenario kind of thoughts of saying, oh my God, I'm gonna like completely get kicked out of UCI because I messed up on this one paper, right? Because when we're heightened, you know, anxiety is like running the show we might kind of get there and just 100% think that that's gonna happen, when in reality, slow it down. Ask yourself some questions, give yourself some breathing room. The other part is some practical tips, right? So um, talking to people about the imposter syndrome, right? So normalizing it a little bit, or just saying, yeah, you know, sometimes I do question whether or not I'm supposed to be here, right? Giving it a name. Um, and, and just normalizing it because again, there's so much research on it that it is quite common, right? Um, and something as simple as saying thank you when someone says good job, accepting it rather than saying, and sometimes there's a lot of cultural comp components to it too because I know sometimes our cultures can kind of inform us and there are some gender roles also playing into it that makes it seem like we're not supposed to um, accept recognition, but sometimes it can be incredibly helpful to also re accept the recognition to help with that sense of I am supposed to be here, right? That I do have a lot of strengths, I have a lot of accomplishments, I have worked hard, right? You can focus on the effort. And then um, treat yourself. When you did something good, treat yourself. I'm a fan of boba, and this is Irvine, so I feel like you kind of got to be a fan of boba. Um, that's like my favorite treat to go. Um, so reward yourself when you accomplish something. Seek out mentors, whether again, that's your professors or your PIs, graduate students, other advisors. If you have mentors in this program, seek them out, talk about it, right? Normalize this experience. And then write out a list of your strengths and accomplishment. Um, I personally like this, I do this myself till this day, which is updating your CV and resume regularly. Right? Um, so at the beginning of every year, I tend to just sort of see, okay, what are some things that I've done in the previous year and what are some things I'm gonna about to do this year? 
some goals that I've set out for myself that are work-related, I put it in the work-related. But if they're professional or personal ones, I put it somewhere else, but I still write it down, saying these are the things I've done and, I, and some of the projects that I'm currently working on that I'm excited about and put it on your CV so it is there. It's concrete proof that you are working really, really hard. You have worked on a lot of things already, right? And it's also a great way to keep track of all the things that you're doing, right? Um, so for example, if once you, once you all like start working, you'll have evaluations on a, on a yearly basis. It's a great way because you, oftentimes you'll get stuck with asking, you know, they'll ask you, what have you done well this year? Well, you can pull out that list and actually just say, yeah, I actually have done a lot. Right? Um, so quick tip, keep constantly updating your CV and resume. It's a great way to keep track of your accomplishments and your strengths. And then be your own friend, honestly. As much as you hype your friends up, hype yourself. Honestly, I see you all just like, you know, on Reddit and Insta and everything. I see how well you all hype each other up. So be your own hype person, honestly. You're all so good at it. Um, Treat yourself to say, yes, I've done really well, and go for that boba. Something else I also want to highlight is, um, actually, before that, I wanted to also just check in with you all. What are other ways that you feel might be helpful? Like, what are some other things in terms of mentors or rewarding yourself or even being your own friend? What are some things that you all do that might be helpful here to kind of voice out for others? Reflect, yeah, reflect on yourself to just see how am I treating myself. Yeah, check in with yourself, absolutely. It's a great way to just sort of check in with yourself to see am I being kind to myself. Yeah, great. Anyone else? Yeah? Um, I'm trying to think like the writing out a list of things and accomplishments, but like writing down a list of things that you should do or just writing down your feelings, honestly, can, yeah. can, can help you get out of that like cycle of stress. Yeah, I love it, journaling it and, um, Maybe it's because of my job, I'm biased, but I, I believe in the power of words, right? Like there's something about spoken word, word or written word or some sort of, sort of expression. So sometimes it can be really powerful to hear yourself or see yourself, just see the, the thoughts that you're having and, that, and being reflective back to you, right? Um, so that can be really helpful as well, journaling consistently, absolutely. Anything else that you'd like to add? Yeah? Yes, thank you. That's so amazing. Thank you. I mean, again, no bias here or anything. Uh, but yes, I love it. The, the suggestion is, yeah, just taking care of your health, your physical and mental health, checking in with a counselor um, if you need to just talk a little bit more and explore more and need some support. Absolutely. Lovely. All right. Um, I'd also like to just like turn your attention to staying curious, right? Because that's the crux. Like that's like at the... The essence of research is curiosity, right? So I want to just like also bring in that, that sense of like curiosity here. I love this quote by Katherine Johnson, uh, who is the, I think, have you all watched that movie Hidden Figures, right? Okay, so you all are aware, um, like she was um, instrumental to the moon landing and work at NASA. So take all the courses in your curriculum, do the research, ask questions, find someone doing what you are interested in, and be curious. Right? So again, there's that word again, curious, questions. Um, take risks, right? Don't limit yourself to just those fears of saying, I'm not good enough or I'm not supposed to be here. Take a chance, be, take a risk, be curious, ask those questions, stand out, it's okay. Um, because again, curiosity is a willing, a proud, and eager confession of ignorance. Right, that's kind of at the, at the essence of curiosity is just to say, I don't know, but I'm really interested in finding out what it is. And it's also admitting that I don't know it, right? And sometimes imposter thoughts and imposter phenomenon can make it feel like maybe I'm supposed to know and I'm not supposed to show that I don't know, right? Kind of like the fake it till you make it. Um, we've all done that, I know I have done that. But you don't have to all the time. You can actually just go in and just say, you know, I'm not quite sure about it. Can you tell me more about it so I can understand it better? Right, owning that, just saying, I want to know more. I want to learn more. Again, adopting that growth mindset and, my, uh, and mentality. 
Because after all, that is what research is, right? If you don't know something, you're curious and you want to know more. You're eager to explore. So, um, and then just again, making space for all that is, right? So even if it is that, that sense of um, insecurity that comes up, those worries that come up, sort of just saying, yes, it's coming up and it's there and it's okay that it's there, rather than saying, I'm not supposed to feel this way, give it room just saying, it's okay that I'm feeling this way. It's not a bad thing, just admit that it's there, but it doesn't have to take center stage. But it doesn't mean you have to push it away anyway. And honestly, pushing away doesn't work anyway. Um, so I'll just give you an example of that. I'll run a quick research study here. So I'm going to ask you, whatever you do, do not think of a white bear. OK? Again, the instruction is, do not think about a white bear. OK? Raising up hands, how many of you thought of a white bear? OK, majority of you, right? Because when your brain hears don't think about something, it's going to think about that something. So it's not possible to just sort of say, don't think about you not feeling good enough, or just don't think about it, don't worry about it. No, it's, your brain is hearing it and just saying, oh, you want me to worry about it. OK, got it, got that message, <laughs> loud and clear, right? Instead now, if I tell you, hey, if you happen to think about a white bear, just notice it. What's different now? What happens? Yeah? Exactly, right? So it's a lot easier to just let it be like, yeah, I thought about it, okay, right? And that's exactly it, is you want to just sort of, if you're noticing having a lot of thoughts of like, maybe I'm not supposed to be here, or you're questioning yourself, or you're feeling that you're not good enough, rather than fully pushing it away, because pushing it away does not work, thought suppression does not work, instead it's about making room for saying, okay, if I am having these thoughts, just observing it, just saying, it's okay that I'm having these thoughts, and what else am I also doing here? Right? How can I challenge these thoughts? Do I need to challenge these thoughts? How much do I want to engage with these thoughts? Right? And if you also need some support in learning how to manage these thoughts that you're having, these experiences, seek out support, whether that's through talking to your mentors, if you want to also con connect with a therapist to explore that a little bit more, go for it. Right? Um, but you don't have to suppress it all the time. And um, this is like my tip in terms of maintaining your curiosity and also your overall well-being. I love this research about nurture with nature. And the main takeaway message of that is um, your brain perks up when you're in nature. And by perking up, I mean you have a lot more um, awareness, you have a lot more um, concentration, your ability to retain information goes up, right? Um, of course, the strength of this is often best when you're in nature directly, right? So nature's greens and blues, um, this is the effect that, that you notice. That's, the sort of, that's what the research sort of indicates. Um, so if you're directly you know, walking around at Aldrich, Aldrich Park or going on a hike, going to the beach, right? You're exposed to nature's blues and greens, it helps. So go with nature, especially when you're taking midterms and finals and working on those papers. You're paying a lot of money to be on this campus, explore it, go to the green spaces that are available to you. But in case you know, you're like, I don't have a time for you know, just like going on a hike today, but even just they saw that you can even look at pictures of blues and greens of nature's and it's not gonna be the same full on impact of it, but even just a little bit of it can perk your brain up. So uh, ever since I came across that research, I'm like, okay, let me just put it in my slideshows. Uh, so anytime I talk about it, I have some greens for people to look at, right? Um, but of course, my, my pro tip is just go take a walk, walk at um, Altered Park. It's beautiful. And uh, breathe, right? Um, so oftentimes when we're stressed out, um, the advice we get from people is to just take some deep breaths. 
yes, please, please take in breaths, but don't forget to breathe out because your out breath is actually what helps activate your parasympathetic nervous system for you all bio nerds. Um, I love that research too. So, you know, your parasympathetic nervous system is in charge of helping you calm down, right? And your sympathetic nervous system gets activated when you're, it's a survival instinct. It's sort of looking at threats in the environment and it gets activated, your heart rate goes up, your muscles um, tense up, your chest kind of will kind of tense up a little bit. You might experience some temperature shifts, trembling, stomach, um, you know, kind of might be nodding, nodding up. All of that is your sympathetic nervous system ge gearing up for survival, right? But the cool thing is our brains has, have like an inbuilt system to help you relax, and that's the parasympathetic nervous system. Right? And that's activated through your out breath. So please remember to breathe out when you're stressed out, right? Because we tend to hold our breaths when you're feeling stressed. Um, and I like to always go back to, like, you know, if you have taken the SATs, think back to just how stressful the time was. And now, collectively, please do it with me. I'd like it. Uh, just, I'd like to hear a whole, like a room of 100 people just sighing with relief that the knowledge that you'll never have to take the SATs ever again in your life. <sighs> all right, how is that sitting with you all as you just like took that sigh of relief? Okay, I see some like shoulders dropping, some movement. And that's exactly it. It's a small way of just knowing that you carry a lot of tension in your bodies and your out breath helps you release that tension. But I like the rule of either 444, four, four, which is four in breath, um, four hold, four out breath, or 426, which is four in breath, hold for two, out for six, which is your out breath is always longer than your in breath, or 448, four, right, which is four in, four hold, and out eight, which is longer and harder, but if you can get there, great. But if you can't, start with either four, 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 or four, two, six. Four plus two is six, right? And four plus four is eight. Um, so pretty simple numbers to remember. And always just remember that you wanna breathe out longer than your in-breath. And um, I do wanna introduce you to a couple of different apps. I'm sure you've come across some of this with meditation, Headspace. Uh, the UCLA Mindful app is also great. It has some free meditations on there. Um, I kind of threw in the Gottman card decks just for, like, I think this is great, especially if you're in relationships and you want to explore your relationship more and um, have more connectionness and connectedness with your partners. It's great. And I am including that because there is life outside of just academia. You, you have partners, you have friendships. So go for it. Maintain the health of those relationships as well. Um, and uh, just remind yourself that I'm doing the best I can. My best is not perfect, and that's okay. A um, couple of things I do want to point out is at the Counseling Center, we have a couple of different services, but uh, on Wednesday, Wednesdays, we have wellness, work, uh, wellness Wednesday workshops and the Academic Boot Camp series. And if you are, or if you know someone who's graduating, the Beyond the Ring Road series might be helpful. And please do me a favor, complete the eval here. It's a, a scan the QR code. Um, just give me some feedback about whether this is helpful or not. And if I need to change it up, I'm more than happy to. Um, but also, yeah, so you, any questions or concerns about anything we've talked about so far? OK. Thank you.